I'm Paris Roberts, Executive Director at IPPR, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this event to discuss the role of profits and corporate power in the inflation we have experienced since the pandemic. Uh, so this is the plenary session of what's actually been a day-long international workshop, and so various people in the audience uh, and colleagues at the table have um, been talking about this for a whole day, so hopefully uh, we can distill some of that for you tonight um, and uh, kind of keep up that conversation. I know we could have kept going for quite a long time. Um, so this event is hosted by IPPR and Commonwealth, two UK think tanks, uh, and we're hosting it with the generous support of the Open Society Foundations. And um, so huge thanks to OSF colleagues um, in the audience for their support for this. Why have we chosen this topic to look at? Um, and I should say as well that we've been doing some research uh, at Africa and Commonwealth that will be out shortly um, and that we'll touch on today. But since the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a rise in the price level around the world, uh, and it's the most significant and sustained period of inflation in decades. But the jury is still out on many very important questions. Um, is it on its way out, this inflationary moment? Uh, how do we tame inflation and what even caused it in the first place? And one of the things that we found really interesting uh, at um, our think tanks is to think through what does this moment tell us um, and what does it tell us about the economic models that we've been operating on um, and the implications for policy if actually they're not uh, quite so useful as we might have thought. So tonight we're going to discuss these topics with leading global experts um, and to paraphrase Milton Friedman, perhaps <laughs> inflation is always and everywhere a distributional phenomenon. Yeah. The costs of rising prices have to be borne by someone, whether it's companies, their employees, the government, and increased costs to consumers have to flow somewhere. The costs of bringing inflation back under control also have to be paid by someone. So at its root, inflation creates winners and losers, and that means it's about politics, not just economics, and we're hoping to uh, get into both of those uh, tonight. We'll open with remarks from our panellists of about five to ten minutes each, and then we'll open out to a uh, question and answer with the audience. We do have some roving microphones, uh, so I'll try and bring as many of you into the conversation as possible. Um, your cooperation in being brief uh, will help us uh, with that. So to introduce our panellists, so to talk about the shift in understanding of the connections between cost shocks, profits, uh, and inflation, we have Isabella Vega. Isabella is an Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and an Associate in Research at the Fairbank Center at Harvard University. Her first book, How China Escaped Shock Therapy, uh, The Market Reform Debate, is the winner of the Joan Robinson Prize and the Keynes Prize. Uh, to talk about uh, rising corporate concentration and its consequences, we have Jan Eckert. I probably mispronounced it, haven't I? Just by asking it. <laughs> uh, so, Jan is a research professor at the Barcelona School of Economics at EPF and professor of economics at University College London. He has teaching and research interests in macroeconomics with a special emphasis on the labour market. Um, he's also published uh, an excellent book, uh, The Profit Paradox, uh, looking at the macroeconomic implications of market power. To talk about the policy and political response to this and how it affects wider civil society, we're joined by Michelle Ma. Michelle is the founder of the Balanced Economy Project, a senior policy fellow at the UCL Centre for Law, um, and author of Competition is Killing Us, another very good book that you can uh, find in all good bookshops. Um, Michelle formerly worked as a lawyer and is an expert in competition law and corporate governance. And then finally, to put these issues into the wider economic and political context, we're joined by Samir Keynes. Samir is the economics columnist for the Financial Times, recently joining from The Economist, where she covered economics, trade and globalisation for eight years. Uh, so, fantastic panel to kick us off tonight. Um, I'm going to turn to each in turn, and Isabella, I wondered if I could start with you to get us into this inflation topic. Thank you so much, Kiara. So uh, let me start by thanking the organizers. I'm really, really thrilled that um, I guess like almost two years into this inflation, we all got into one room internationally um, to share perspectives and um, share um, our analysis of inflation. Um, in fact, I'm thrilled because I think the ways in which we interpret the return of inflation 
really matters. It matters for what happened, but it also matters for policy making and it matters for where we are moving. Um, some of you might know that I have been using the term seller's inflation to try to make sense of um, the return of inflation. In fact, the term seller's inflation is not my own invention. It's the invention of Albert Lerner in the 1950s when they were dealing with a similar kind of inflationary dynamic. And what Albert Lerner was arguing is that there's nothing inherent in um, basis of profits that would rule out that either one of them can be the driver of inflation. So we all know that wages can be drivers of inflation, but basically it could also be the case that profits are the driver of inflation. Now the question is, of course, we have seen very stable kind of um, price environment for about two decades or so, at a time when corporate concentration was already incredibly high, as uh, Jan's uh, impressive empirical research has um, documented um, so carefully. Um, so then the question becomes, why is it the case that um, within this same kind of institutional arrangement, you suddenly see firms start hiking prices? And what we are arguing in joint work with Evan Wassner, who's actually also in the room, is that there have been massive cost shocks in systemically important sectors like energy, food staples, raw materials, and transportation that came about through the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. And that these cost shocks have corresponded to an explosion of prices and profits in these specific kinds of sectors. So if you take the example of the energy sector, you have had the massive shocks that I think are all obvious to everyone that have resulted in a massive increase in prices and along with this massive increase in prices, a massive increase in profits and margin. But in these sectors, firms are actually not setting prices, even though they are very large, but by and large, there are some sort of price takers in a very financialized, very complex kind of market. However, the question then becomes uh, very much in line with the Milton Friedman quote that has been just shared. If these important, systemically significant goods are becoming more expensive, who is picking up the bid? And I think what we have seen is that by and large, the corporate sector in most countries has been in a pretty good position to fend off what presented itself to, to the corporate sector as a cost shock by passing on not only the cost increase, but actually keeping profit margins more or less stable. Now, why is that the case? We argue after reading many, many earnings calls and trying to understand how corporate leaders are thinking about this, that these cost shocks themselves have coordinated the price hikes in the sense that when firms in a sector know that all competitors are facing the same kind of cost shock and they're pricing to keep certain um, target margins more or less where they are, then they re respond to this cost shock by hiking prices such as to hit this, this target margin. So the cost shock itself becomes a coordination mechanism for, um, uh, for, for price hikes. You might ask, well, but how about the demand side? And what we glean from reading um, corporate earnings calls is that what corporate leaders have observed is that in the context of these emergencies, in the context of these shocks, consumers have been more willing to pay higher prices because they have perceived them as kind of logical in the sense that they have seen these shocks, let's say they have seen grain prices shoot up because of what happened in Ukraine, um, and then they go in the shop and buy a package of pasta, and they see the price went up, and they go like, yeah, of course the price went up, we have this huge grain prices, and they have no way to judge um, what the amount of cost of grain in a package of pasta is, but their mindset has changed, or um, to put it uh, more technically, uh, the elasticity of demand has changed. Of course, the increase um, in household income, uh, in, in some instances, has also helped to sustain um, uh, this demand, but an increase in, in the budget alone, I think, would not have been enough to um, uh, uh, encourage consumers to absorb these higher prices, or at least that seems to be what we get from many of the earnings cause reasoning. Now, of course it is the case that not all firms have been equally well positioned to pass on these cost shocks. So therefore we see, or this is one of the reasons, I mean, we still need more research, but we see a large heterogeneity across firms and across sectors in terms of what happened to margins. 
But what is important to keep in mind is that if you have a cost shock and in response to a cost shock, a profit margin is kept stable, this actually means that profits go up. This is like when you go buy a house, which I don't know, these days it's always a bit of a touchy issue, especially among younger audiences. But imagine you were in a position to buy a house. <laughs> imagine, as the economists say, let's assume uh, you could go out to London and buy a house for 200,000 pounds. <laughs> let's assume, for the sake of the argument, um, and uh, the brokerage fee is 3%. Well, I mean, then you would pay a brokerage fee of, fee of whatever, 6,000. Uh, pounds, right? Now let's assume you actually have to pay one million pounds for your house, it might be a slightly more realistic assumption in the London context, um, but the brokerage fee stays at 3%, well then obviously you are paying a much, much higher brokerage fee, even though the percentage has stayed the same, right? So the exact same kind of effect happens with profit margins, cost shocks, and profits. I'm very much so the, um, the, the, the labor sector of the economy ends up experiencing a collapse in real wages, which we have seen across European countries in a pretty pronounced way. For example, in Germany, which you can probably figure that I'm from Germany given my fake German accent. Um, so if I look at the German time series, I can see that um, in the context of this inflation, we have seen the most dramatic collapse in real wages that we have seen since the beginning of this time series. It goes back to the 1960s. Okay. So eventually, workers will fight back, right? They will fight back against the decline in real wages, against the decline in living standards, against the declining purchasing power. So eventually, we get a catch-up in wages, which is what, what I would argue is the third stage of this inflation. After cost shocks have been translated into generalized inflation through sellers' inflation, eventually you get conflict inflation as workers start to fight back. Now, maybe after I've tried to explain what seller's inflation is, it might be useful to say what seller's inflation is not, um, because <laughs> there has been, as I say, a huge amount of confusion. So um, seller's inflation is not greedflation in the sense that greedflation is typically thought of as a sudden change in attitude on the part of corporate leaders that maybe as a side effect of COVID or something might have become more greedy. That's not my theory. I mean, some sophisticated epidemiologists might come up with that side effect. That's not me, okay? Um, also, greedflation is typically associated with the idea that mar margins would have gone up across the economy. <coughs> we argue that margins have gone up in some systemically important sectors, but they have not necessarily, for our, our argument, gone up across the economy. Now, reflation, of course, also has this moral undertone, right? And I would say that it's not a change in, in morale that is driving inflation, but it is, of course, a morally hugely problematic outcome if um, uh, uh, corporations and profit, I mean, pro profit massively in a time, time of emergencies after um, uh, uh, communities have lost their loved ones after people um, have been uh, 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 going through all sorts of trauma, right? So for, I'm not saying it's not mor morally problematic, but I don't think it comes, it doesn't originate from a change in moral attitude. It's, service inflation is also not about an increase in corporate concentration, rather it is about a change in the competition dynamic that happens because of these shocks and these overlapping emergencies in a given institutional kind of structure. So if this is the case, why would it then matter that we talk about sellers' inflation? Well, first of all, there is the question of who wins, right? I think I have already illustrated that basically um, up until the conflict stage, um, uh, the corporate sector wins and the labor sector loses from a functional income distribution perspective. And what, what's happening in the conflict inflation stage is open. Um, if we try to fight conflict inflation by hiking interest rates, we basically aim at preventing the wage catch-up, which might amount to cementing a redistribution of income from the corporate, um, sorry, from the labor to the corporate sector. But there's also a change in personal income distribution because poorer people tend to spend much more of their money on essentials, on housing, food transportation, utilities. Now these prices have gone up disproportionately. So simply from these 
So through level price shocks, we already get a redistribution of personal income. But there's a third dimension. There has been an increase in profit flows, and these profit flows are incredibly unequally distributed. We have forthcoming work um, on the fossil fuel sector where we can see how basically the top 1% very, very, very disproportionately benefits from this. So this is to say rich households actually have their inflation burden compensated from profit flows. Now you could say, okay, this is an interesting story about the past, inflation is easing, everything is back to normal, things are nice, and we can all sit here and have drinks and be relaxed. I would argue um, we are in an age of over overlapping emergencies. Climate change is a reality. The age of global boiling um, has been announced by the, by the General Secretary um, of the United Nations. Um, the pandemic is not over. Um, the global political order is as unstable as we haven't seen it in decades. And that kind of situation, I think, is a, a matter of when and where the next shock is going to hit and not whether there will be another shock. I would argue that sellers' inflation is a new playbook and the next shock is likely to be responded by the same kind of playbook unless we put institutional and policy guardrails into place. Fantastic. Thank you. Isabel. Yeah, and your work has really pioneered um, the study of market power. What's your perspective on this? <laughs> <laughs> Say the question was different when we started. So, <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me first start with you know what is what is market power in, in, in the first place. At least what, what we see is that starting in nineteen eighties, there's a change in, in what we observe in terms of, of you know, dominance of firms, and, and and there's different ways to measure this, like the old style concentration ratios. There's ways in which you can measure it through what we call markups. There's ways in which we can measure it through profits, there's ways in which we can measure the probability trade of firms in stock market valuations. And what we see in each of them is that there's a, a, a steady rise starting in the 1980s. Um, and then the question is what has happened in the last kind of uh, uh, three years, so to speak, since the, since the pandemic. So the thing we saw over the four decades before that was basically an increase in the average, whatever measure you prefer, these markups, these profit rates, these uh, um, stock market valuations. But the main thing we saw was that there's an increase in this, this dispersion of these measures. So basically, most of the firms didn't see any gain from their profits, for example, but a few firms saw enormous gains. And if we see that the profit rate in, on average in the economy went from roughly 2% uh, as a share of GDP to something like more uh, 8%, that doesn't mean that all firms became more profitable. There was a few firms that became extremely profitable. Okay, and that's also reflected in, in, in stock market valuations. If you see an, an Apple that in three years went from one trillion to three trillion valuation, that's just reflecting the fact that these profits have, have, have come out. Now the question is what happened in the last, say, three years, okay, since, since, since the pandemic. And one of the things that we observe, and of course, clearly market power, which is measuring something about prices relative to cost is related to inflation, which is about prices. And so what we see in the last three years is that these markets have not changed. The average market hasn't changed, the distribution of markets hasn't, hasn't changed. What we do see is that there's an enormous rise in profits, profit rates. And what does that mean? Firms have become much more profitable from, let's say, 2000, mid-2000, 2020, rather, uh, 2021, and been extremely profitable, that's now coming down again, okay, out at the same rate as inflation. There seems to be kind of a smoking gun here about the relationship between what's going on in terms of profitability and, 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 and these measures. But remember that if the markups don't go up, what are markups? It's basically the price at which you sell something and how much relative to how much it costs to produce this. Okay, so this is really price relative to cost of production. And then if that's flat, that can't really be just purely because of ex exerting market power by these firms. But at the same time, what are profits then? Well, profit take, profits take into account much more than just the cost of production. They take into account investment. They take into account uh, um, R&D. They take into account uh, uh, marketing and advertising. And they take into account uh, uh, inventories. And so what has happened is basically that over this period, 
when we had this perfect storm of the war in the Ukraine, the supply chain uh, shocks that we have observed, during that perfect storm that has basically led to a disequilibrium, if you want, of supply and demand, there was much more demand than there was uh, supply, that basically firms have been adjusting, not so much their price relative to their cost ratio, but they've been adjusting is their investment, their inventories. Okay, and that's basically something that we see uh, in the last uh, uh, three years. So basically the rise in prices, that doesn't mean that prices haven't risen, okay? because prices have risen, but also costs have risen for these firms. And that's, uh, uh, if you want, kind of the, the, the story of the last three years. That doesn't mean also, by the way, that we expect market power not to change in the future. One of the reasons why we, for example, we don't see huge rises in the stock market valuations, we saw huge rises in the beginning of uh, the COVID crisis, but then they came down immediately, is of course that the response by the government was to increase interest rates. And the stock market valuation is a combination of two things. It's basically the expectations of future profits, but it's also the uh, rate at which you discount the future. If interest rates goes up, you discount the future more, and therefore you should see a lowering of the stock market valuations. The fact that stock market valuations have remained more or less constant means that we still expect, or investors still expect higher profits, but they see uh, uh, they have to discount more. So basically it's the higher interest rate that lead to this stagnant uh, outcome in, in, in the stock market valuations. Why do we care about these measures of market power? Well, in the long run and over these four decades that we've looked at, one of the big kind of issues is that this has enormously wide, uh, economy-wide implications. You could say, from a point of view, and you hear this by politicians all the time, it's great that the stock market is, is, is very high. Okay? It's good news, it's, it's reflecting the fact that the, the business sector is doing well, and all of this is eventually end, ending up in, in the rest of the economy. The problem with that is what we see is that if profits are high because of market power, lack of competition, what this leads to is a number of uh, implications in the labor market. One of the things that we see consistently over the last four decades is a decline in the labor share. So the expenditure on labor as a share of GDP has declined. There's the old color effect that this is around two thirds. We're now at 58%. Okay, that's a substantial decline. Related to that is the stagnation of wages that we observe. So we see that wages relative to productivity in the, until the 1980s grew at the same rate. And then from 1980 onwards, productivity kept growing. There's an issue of also productivity slowdown, but productivity kept, kept growing and wages uh, uh, have stagnated. And so this de decoupling of the wages and the productivity is coming from the fact that there's actually an, an increase in market power. <coughs> These profits are the result of lack of uh, competition. The third implication is for the, the, the business sector in general. And if you think about, you know, if you tell people we are in a digital age, uh, now really, you know, we are in an age of startups and new firms. If we measure the number of startups in the economy in 1980, it was around 14% of all companies. You would say, well, 1980 was the beginning of the digital ages. There should be more startups now. Well, today there's 8%. So we've seen a decline in the number of startups. You might find this not credible what I'm telling you, but you know, take any measure that you can find about markets about the startups, and you see a decline uh, uh, there. And what is this telling is that there's a decline in what we call business dynamism, the speed at which new companies get created. And ultimately, why do we care so much about new companies? Because these are the companies that basically hire more, they hire more young people in particular, but they also grow faster and they innovate more. Okay. And so basically, we see that the rate of innovation therefore has been declining as a result of the fact that we have fewer firms that are the innovative firms uh, that are doing that. And I think this is the main Thing or the main reason why we care about this dominant position of these firms, because they have these enormously vast uh, implications uh, for the rest of, of, of the economy. We'll have more discussions, so I will leave the, uh, my comments uh, here. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Michelle, can I turn to you next uh, on the policy and political Thank you so much. And I wanted to also kind of thank the conveners, um, the organisers for convening this conversation, um, which is incredibly important and timely. And I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and have a think about what competition policy has to say about 
um, some of the issues that have been raised. I'm going to go back um, into the history of, of antitrust policy, because if we look at the you know, what stimulated um, the Sherman Act in the US, the kind of um, canonical um, antitrust law, it was a concern around power. It was concerned around power of particular firms. Um, and it was really created to regulate the existence of these railroad and oil monopolies. Um, and what's interesting there is that it was fundamentally about distributional questions. It was about the politics um, of how the economy runs and for whom. And it was very explicitly about um, power and the freedom of the of corporate power and the freedom of the citizen, citizenry. And we've come quite far from that vision of kind of corporate regulation to, to where we are now. But what's so interesting to me about um, well, there are many aspects that are interesting about this conversation and um, Isabella and others work, but it's bringing us back into this frame of thinking about systemically important firms and systemically important sectors. Um, and this is important for a couple of reasons. One is that the public understands that framing, um, which I think in many of these kind of policy conversations is something that we should hold on to. They understand it um, most recently from uh, the discussions of you know, too big to fail um, and, and other kind of such framings um, from the 2008 crisis. And I think that it also kind of, that, that starts to create like a bit of public legitimacy um, for why we might then intervene in quite um, substantial ways. Now, although the, the Sherman Act and, and other competition laws were created or stimulated by a concern around the existence of particular firms, that's not actually the law that we ended up with. We ended up with um, a law that was concerned with abuse of dominant position, not dominant position or monopoly itself, and was concerned very narrowly with um, conduct. But again, if I go back kind of a little bit further in, in history, originally we regulated corporations based you know, through their incorporation license um, based on at the firm level, and we were very concerned with their systemic importance and their kind of impact on the public interest. So, for example, those early um, early corporate licenses would forbid cross ownership um, amongst firms, cross directorships. They limited the amount of um, debt that a firm could take take on. All sorts of limitations we put on the corporation because we were corporate wary. We kind of there was an understanding that the corporation is a consolidation of economic and political power and therefore a potential threat to the state um, and to the demos and that therefore it needed to be kind of regulated quite substantially. And one kind of interesting side fact is that when we, we ended up with the antitrust law um, in the form of the Sherman Act, at the same time Congress was debating a federal incorporation law instead. In the US, firms are incorporated at the state level and that's led to a race to the bottom. So most um, public list companies in the US are, are incorporated in Delaware where the um, corporate governance and corporate responsibility regime is at its lowest kind of common denominator. Um, so these, these uh, what I'm kind of getting at here is that we can try to get to um, firm power through tax, through corporate governance, through antitrust, and originally these were kind of done in quite a, a, a systematized way. And we are going after all of these different manifestations of corporate power separately, whether we're trying to get it, it through environmental law or labor law or you know, whatever it is. Um, I think that there's some, some um, benefit to starting to think more holistically. And to me, the kind of systemic importance um, framing helps think about, you know, helps us think about why we might do that. The second kind of point, and I think this is fundamental, is that what this means is, particularly for competition policies, we need to talk about power. Um, what is it? When does it show up? How does it show up? Competition law has been obsessed with um, a very narrow understanding of power, which is power um, over price, specifically raising price over marginal cost. Um, the irony is it never saw that anywhere, you know, in no, no case, you know, very few cases could actually point to um, a market a, a market or a firm that even had that power. Um, and we had, for example, hardly any excessive prices, pricing cases or price gouging. You know, these are, this is not the kind of framework in which 
um, competition law would analyze power. And I would argue it's one of the reasons you know, our unwillingness to see even power over price is one of the reasons that Isabella faced a kind of vilification online when she even she had the audacity to, to kind of talk about this. Um, you know, textbook 101, what is monopoly power? It's monopoly power over price, but we never, we never actually see it. What's interesting is that this idea that this is what competition law is limited to, um, power over price, is not actually written into the law itself. Um, the law is incredibly broad. Um, it doesn't say anything about uh, consumer welfare, it doesn't talk about efficiencies, and the EU law definition of dominance um, references the power to act independently of your consumers, your customers, and of the market. And to me, that's an open door um, into which other conceptions of power could be um, introduced. And it's a door that I hope and I would encourage kind of economists of all across all different disciplines to really push on that um, open door. Because you know, when I was um, coming from this kind of narrow understanding of power um, in competition law, when I was writing um, my book, I wanted to understand, okay, what is what is what do broader disciplines of, of economics have to say about power? And there's hardly anything really, um, and except if you kind of go down the rabbit hole of kind of Marxist economics and you're looking at kind of power relationships and like try talk to a um, policymaker about Marxist economics, you will very you know, soon be um, on a one-sided conversation. So <laughs> I think that there's a huge gap that can be filled. You know, I'm interested um, in some of what, what I've heard today around you know, the power, a firm's power to insulate itself from, from cost shocks. Um, is that an aspect of power that we can, can look at more deeply? I'm interested in the power to ex externalize costs more broadly. That's something that I've been looking at in the context of um, the climate crisis and firms that may be abusing their dominant position by um, not including the true co cost of their um, of their raw materials or even you know not including the cost of their production processes in price. So how can we start to be a bit more um, holistic in the way that we look about uh, look at power? And the the third point that I'm going to make is just that. Um, the competition policy is an extremely powerful um, policy lever. It's one that the firms take incredibly seriously, and they do so because, for I think, a couple of reasons. One is that competition agencies, unlike pretty much any other agency, um, can has the have the power to fine companies um, up to ten percent of their global turnover. So, yeah, you know, that is something that firms are going to take extremely seriously. The second thing is that the thing that firms love to do is merge. And they have to ask for permission to do so from the competition authority. So that is like a very powerful leverage point or kind of regulatory touch point at which we should, I think, start to incorporate some of the concerns that we've heard about um, on this panel and, and more broadly today. Um, and those considerations are absolutely not being taken into account currently. Um, there's also, I think, a political opportunity here because the area of... Um, of antitrust policy and competition policy is undergoing a real kind of revolution around its you know, very core tenets of what it means. And this is more, um, you know, progressing to different extents in the EU, in the UK, and certainly in the US. So I, this is a kind of moment in which to have these conversations and redefine you know, what do we mean by power? Um, and I think it would be um, a, a kind of a, a waste not to, not to do that. Thank you, Michelle. So I think I'm going to try and make it my job to annoy everyone. Um, <laughs> the panel. Um, apologies in advance. Um, I hope they'll be corrected when I say things that, that you think are wrong or you disagree with. Um, okay, so I was given the task of saying how we got there, and I'm, I'm going to try and do that a bit, and then sort of um, outline where I think some of the sort of disagreements are bubbling under the surface, um, um, which have been very kind of politely presented. Um, so. Um, I think, you know, the, the context is obviously this, I think this story sort of started in the US, right, the whole kind of reinflation, sellers inflation, that's obviously where it was based, um, it was obviously very controversial, and I think, you know, from one side of the, the argument, um, this was born out of a reluctance to um, acknowledge that there was something wrong in the Biden stimulus, right, there was a big Biden stimulus, huge package, it was extraordinarily progressive, much more progressive than anything the Europeans managed, 
Um, that was seen as a you know, huge policy success, getting money to people who needed it most. And so the idea that that could then have triggered this huge inflation, that there could have been too much demand in the system, that was just extraordinarily, um, people were very reluctant to, to accept that. That was a very difficult message to, to swallow. So that's, that's kind of what one side thinks of, of the other. Um, on the other side, though, I think you know, there are some who, who saw the kind of reaction to the idea of sellers inflation um, or greedflation and thought it was it was far too quick. There was a kind of gut reaction of don't don't be absurd. This isn't of course this isn't about corporate behaviour, this is about aggregate demand mm -hmm. and aggregate supply. End of conversation, that's the entirety of the analysis I'm gonna present. Which which <laughs> if you if you were kind of greedflation curious wasn't exactly um, very convincing. Um, so I think there are kind of um, those dynamics at play um, on on both sides. I, th I think there has been, you know, this, this point about redistribution that you mentioned at the beginning, um, I think it's not just, you know, paraphrasing Milton Friedman, this, this idea that inflation was, is ultimately about kind of distributional battles, you know, Olivia Blanchard um, made this point on Twitter, he said, you know, inflation is fundamentally the outcome of the distributional conflict between firms, workers and taxpayers, it only stops when the various players are forced to accept the outcome. So, you know, this idea, it's not, it's not kind of, woke, extreme, heterodox, whatever, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's, there's space within the kind of mainstream to talk about those, those distributional um, battles. Um, okay, so that's the preamble. Um, so what do we know? I think, I think the consensus is, and this is partly based on Jan's um, um, excellent work, um, that, you know, over the past few decades, markets have been rising, competition seems to have been falling. Um, I guess, I, I don't know if, I think maybe I missed it, but lots of Jan's data that you were describing to particularly recently is for the US, right? So the idea that um, markups haven't risen more recently, that's a US finding. I don't think we, um, I think the Bank of England has actually done some work on this, but, um, uh, pardon? That's right, yes. Um, uh, um, so, so I think it's, you know, there's been some IMF um, research looking into this concept of, of um, trying to break down um, the GDP deflator, so trying to look into the national accounts to see if it tells us anything about what's driving what. Um, and they actually find quite a different story between um, the EU and, and um, or at least just the euro area and the US. Um, so it is worth bearing in mind that you could have these different mechanisms being of different importance across um, countries. So the, the standard narrative is that we've got this big um, aggregate supply shock in the form of COVID. In the US in particular, there was this big aggregate demand shock. It's quite a simple story. Um, uh, yeah, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the UK at the same time, we had these very tight labor markets. Um, so that there is a kind of obvious, you know, the, the obvious story is like, well, you know, supply demand interacting. You don't need these micro dynamics to kind of give you um, what we got. Um, okay, so now Isabella's going to get annoyed with me because I'm going to try and kind of explain my interpretation of how I see the paper to try and reconcile the, the various findings here. Um, so, as I understand it, Isabella and Evan are not arguing that it's the pre-existing market power out there in the economy, the pre-existing kind of difference between markups um, of various different firms that was driving this inflation, right? Essentially what we had is we, we, we had a distribution of market power out there then we had these huge cost shocks, um, and then essentially there was a different distribution of market power um, that, that kind of firms experienced. Um, you know, you had uh, some firms that suddenly, given all these supply chain bottlenecks, um, found themselves temporary monopolists, right? They, they had these sort of localized um, mini monopolies, which gave them power. Um, at the same time, you know, this price drop essentially was a coordinating device. They could coordinate their price increases um, across these sort of mini, mini um, pockets of market power. Um, and, uh, and so the fact that this kind of new distribution of market power didn't really entirely align with the old one presents this huge kind of computational challenge, right? Lots of the people trying to test this idea went out and said, okay, well, is it the case that firms with huge markups were the ones that um, increase their prices most, right? And they didn't find that. Um, and one explanation is because you've got these different um, kind of sources of market power. One sort of temporary, brought on by the pandemic, she's nodding, 
Um, uh, and then the other kind of the product of Yang's work over a long, long time horizon. Um, and the best evidence I think we have is this kind of qualitative data looking at earnings calls where you have people on, on corporate boards describing why they're increasing prices, right? It, it's very difficult to go to the data to sort of, you know, if you look at these dot plots of distributions of, you know, um, uh, price increases and markup, you effectively just see a cloud. There's nothing, there's nothing really to see there. Um, and, and partly that's, again, this, this, this thing that Isabella referenced, which is, you know, you might think that just being able to maintain your, your margins, being able to, to kind of keep mockups the same, maybe that um, is a sign that something's wrong because in a, in a different world, perhaps those markets, margins would have fallen, right? So we're in this kind of weird, weird world of counterfactuals. Um, the, the prediction for what you would see in the aggregate data from Isabella's story um, is, is it's difficult to pin down when you kind of look at, looking at things in the kind of, um, uh, in the data. Um, so I think, um, I think the kind of the challenge when sort of assessing what's going on here is that, again, if, if I'm interpreting Isabella and Evan correctly, they're, they're not claiming that this is the whole story, right? They're claiming it's part of the story. I think there is a role of aggregate demand in what they're saying, um, which then obviously kind of means that you're in a very fuzzy territory of like, okay, how much? <laughs> um, you know, at that point, I think, you know, a central banker would say, well, let's write down a model and try and um, you know, is it 16.3 percent? Is it is it 34.7 percent? You you know to sort of try and quantify well, how important do we think these two different things are? Because if that is inflation is 0.4 percent, then it's a neat idea, but does it really matter? And should we overthrow our entire framework? Um, so I think when you know we, we kind of need if we're going to if we want policymakers to think about this kind of more seriously, I think we probably do need better ways of thinking about the estimates of, of, you know, okay, how important is this actually relative to the traditional stories um, that we're used to telling. Um, okay. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba. Um, yeah, okay, so I think um, this is another kind of uh, sort of awkward point, which is that the data is a mess. Um, you've got lots and lots of different measures of profits. You've got accounting profits. Um, you've got markups, which is you know revenue and marginal cost. Um, you have like a fuller definition of, of, of profits, and and things are kind of moving around in in kind of difficult ways. So, um, Jan will kind of explain this better than me. But you know, one one danger you have when looking at the accounting data in the national accounts is that well, what if firms have lots of, what if they had lots of inventory that they were sitting on. And then the pandemic came along and they said, okay, well, we have to sell it all because we can't, you know, demand's through the roof. That inventory will have been produced at a lower kind of pre-pandemic cost before these supply chain um, disruptions. The danger is, I mean, there are attempts to adjust for this in the national accounts, but the danger is that when you're doing all these computations, you accidentally count that product sold at that higher price but relative to that lower pre-pandemic cost as a kind of increase in your profit margins. Um, and actually that's like a slightly different mechanism to the one being um, described. You don't really need to hold that in your head. The point yeah. is, um, luckily, the, the point is that when interpreting the data, sometimes um, the way that the national accounts are compiled um, can be kind of really annoying and misleading um, and can kind of muck up your conclusions in a, in a very inconvenient way. Um, so in terms of kind of where we should go from here, I think better data uh, would be great. More research, uh, economists always call for more research because it keeps them busy. Um, I, think, I think there's a kind of, um, I guess a final wrinkle um, is that when we're thinking about kind of competition policy, when we're thinking about antitrust, lots of those things are quite slow moving. Right, so if you think about, um, you know, we, we're worried about this particular sector, whatever, it, it's, it's, it's very, you, you think about that through the lens of the trends that Jan was describing. You think of that through the kind of long run, you know, we, ha we have to gather data on how firms in this industry have behaved over the past three, five years, right? Whereas the kind of temporary monopolies in, that have been generated by these shocks can come up quite quickly 
Um, it's very, very difficult to kind of identify where they are um, as a policymaker. All you can kind of see is the price outcomes. Um, and so actually, it's extremely challenging, I think, to combine that kind of long-term competition policy with the kind of competitiveness policies that you might want if you think that the sellers' infl inflation um, is an issue. Okay, so Isabel is nodding. Yeah, it hasn't punched me, so I think... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, I have tons of questions, but we have limited time, so I'm going to open it up to the audience and, and ask both people in the audience and people on the panel to keep their answers quite brief so we can get to as many as possible. Um, so if I could see some hands, I will take a few at a time. Um, I was starting to kind of worry. Same thing well, perhaps, as well. Thanks, Karis. Rory McQueen, you're not the Indian. Not working, can you hear me? Rory McQueen, you're not the Indian. Um, thank you, everybody, for a very interesting talk. But, uh, somebody just referred to the measurement issue, and I'm just going to bring in another potential one, which is the ONS's profitability bulletin comes out quarterly and reports return on capital employed, adjusted for depreciation. But it's capital uh, replacement cost. So obviously this is a situation in which, uh, if I'm a business owner, um, all of my capital is immediately worth more, and in that situation, uh, the ONS constantly refers to a basically flat profitability trend. Um, and in that situation, I suppose the question to Isabella and perhaps Yang is whether this idea of uh, flat profitability on this measure, which is the one that gives rise to the FT headline of no greedflation every four months, is what you would expect to see um, given in the national account sense. This is supposedly an external shock and there's very tight labour market, uh, but actually this profitability is flat, but on the basis that um, capital is constantly being revalued at much higher uh, prices. Sorry, Randy, but if anyone else wants to talk about Marxist distribution rabbit holes, then I'll be outside. Right <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks for your hands again. Um, I'll go to the uh, back. Hi, I'm Ali with Commonwealth. Um, at Commonwealth, we're releasing a report soon that makes the argument for public power generation through public enterprise as a way to perform both necessary socialization of investment decision making, but also as a tool for macro stabilization because public ownership can allow for more flexible price setting and slower price setting. Um, but that configuration of socialization, uh, stabilization through that particular form of public enterprise is perhaps specific to that sector. But I'm curious, this is perhaps tailored to both Isabella and Jan, if you see other sectors where transformation of ownership through also different forms, not just the public utility model, might be a useful aim of progressive policy making. Thank you, and I'll take one more. Uh, Thank you, thank you for this uh, great panel. I think my, my question is, uh, should I have someone there? Hello. <laughs> no, it's just, it's, uh, perhaps just a clarification, because you started with um, the stimulus, right? And, um, at the time, there was this massive discussion if it was a supply and demand shock, right? And they, there was even a discussion if it was a, uh, sorry, I can't see you, if it was a, um, <coughs> that could be deflationary, right? And then it could be deflationary because of uh, the loan curve would go downwards. And, uh, and then in that case, the stimulus, you know, wouldn't be a problem in all this discussion, you know, if the economy was at full employment and et cetera. And then, of course, if it was the supply side, then it would be different because you have a change in both in, uh, in the short run kind of curve and also the long run. And then that was a massive deal. And there was this um, very interesting blog at LSE uh, interviewing the top economists at the time if they think it was supply side. Or, or, and that is before any stimulus, before any government um, intervention. So in, in that matters a lot to be guarding how we see the framework, because if you start from the supply side, then yeah, perhaps we don't need to change anything in macro, but if, if it was a demand side, and how you address that? So it would be just a short run, but then nothing happens in the long run. Uh, so I just wonder, 
Yeah, yeah. why are you start with the stimulus and not with the macro the macroeconomic framework regarding how to understand what will happen to inflation before any government intervention? Too much? <laughs> sorry, sorry. I mean, I, we can talk later. <laughs> <laughs> we talk later. Okay, that's right. <laughs> um, I might take one more then, if that's um, what I can say. Um, thanks. Um, it's Carsten, you're from IPPR. Um, my question is, um, can we imagine a few very specific things we could change in the near term? And concretely, uh, one would be on uh, measurement. So the Bank of England uh, you know, base a lot of their decisions on inflation policy on earnings calls and, and sorry, not earnings calls on um, wage data. That would be bad. I mean, on labor market data, right? It's one of the and the same as the Fed, one of the most closely watched indicators. Now, you know, we've heard today that both in theory and practice, um, profits can also be. Uh, a, a driver of inflation. So what would it look like for macro institutions to monitor profits or other corporate sector development in order to inform decision making? What would they monitor? And, and to also just to, to throw over something at, at Michelle on, on policy, you mentioned like the Digital Markets Act and the UK Digital Markets Bill are being more forward looking. And my understanding is like basically the competition regulator can say, oh, that thing you're about to do with pricing, don't do that. Um, so what, right? So they, they can prevent bad things from happening before they happen. What would that look like? That competition policy would look like if we expanded it to other sectors such as, you know, uh, energy or food. What, you know, just as a, as a policy <coughs> policy idea. Great. And um, so we've got some questions on measurement here, and we've got some questions on policy tools, and and one on the stimulus and kind of why it's not here. Um, I won't ask everyone to answer everything, but if you um, pick out ones that are most relevant to your work. Um, Isabella, perhaps you could start with some of these kind of measurement issues. Yeah, um, of course I have to very briefly speak to the demand. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I agree with everything uh, that has been said about our research. I would just qualify that why we don't think the pre-existing markups determine um, the competition dynamic, there can still be an interaction that I think is just understudied. And I think that it's not necessary to have this, this determination to have that kind of dynamic, but we don't really understand yet how it works, just to be sure. Um, okay, but on, and then a second point on aggregate demand. So I absolutely agree that we need um, models to estimate the contribution of different factors um, to inflation. I think what has happened is that there has been, I mean, no one estimated the role of demand by getting rid of status inflation either, right? So therefore, like, there is a danger of by just sticking to the mental model that you had, assuming that the role of demand might be larger than it empirically actually is, um, because you only retrospectively end up um, having the data, adjusting your models and so on. So because everybody had the mindset that inflation always driven by aggregate demand or maybe some uh, archaic uh, monitors uh, buy too much money chasing too few goods. Therefore, this was like kind of the legitimate assumption that you didn't have to prove, right? So I think in that sense, as good empiricists, we should just apply the same criteria in both um, directions. Okay, that was, um, and I could talk much more about demand, but I'll stop right here um, and I'll be outside and talk with you about mm -hmm. demand for one hour. Or two. <laughs> um, <laughs> so on the question of measurement, um, I mean, there have been indices coming out um, of central banks based on earnings calls, and we are actually following up um, with a um, very large computational exercise with chat GTP and natural language modeling and everything that you wish for, um, dra drawing on <laughs> earnings calls to also um, construct new indices um, to look at exactly some of these um, measures. I'm not saying that ours will be necessarily better than the central bank or whatever, but we are just trying to push the agenda of um, thinking about ways in which one can measure this. Um, I think in terms of looking at profit numbers, the most pragmatic um, uh, way would be to look at the numbers as they are coming out of the earnings reports, because of course for markups you have to do calculations as I don't need to tell you, <laughs> right? But the earnings reports actually contain um, measures of um, profit margins and profit flows, so I think would be if you want to do something in real time and within the age of AI, I think it would be 
probably quite feasible to do this with the resources that central banks have, you would probably want to monitor that. On the note of monitoring, I think we have to um, move from um, only monitoring indices like CPI or PPI, but just like smush all the prices together to also monitoring systemically important prices. To give you an example, um, the gas price, of course, has exploded last year, right? Um, the German government, for example, has still been working on a gas price surcharge in like August and beginning of September 2022, which illustrates that they did not recognize this price as having the potential to result in systemic instability. And then eventually they had a 180 degree policy turnaround. But at that point at which we could still implement a stabilization policy, um, we already had more than one year of literally exploded gas prices. They were already rippling through the whole system. So I think monitoring systemically important prices is something that is really important moving forward. What then exactly would be done in response would of course be nice to be prepared and already have a toolbox and so on. But even if you don't know yet what you're gonna do, I think recognizing that some prices have this, the potential to create systemic instabilities um, and thereby having a mandate, let's say for, I mean, in the European contracts, the central bank of the member states, um, for example, could do such monitoring and would have to alert the Ministry of Economic Affairs and say, here, gas price uh, yellow <laughs> or something, right? So that there's a mandate to start thinking about this in time, even if you don't have a toolbox ready. I mean, of course, it would be even better if you had a toolbox and so on. But as a first step, I think this is something to think about. On the socialization um, question, um, I mean, there's a rather depressing case that is Austria, where you actually have a very, very high um, public ownership of um, utility companies, and you still have huge uh, windfall profits um, and uh, um, uh, a huge, um, actually like one of the largest um, gas and power price shocks for consumers in, 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 in the European um, Union, um, which indicates that public ownership is not enough if you then organize your companies based on still profit maximization, right? So I think we have to think about the dynamic that is at stake and then think about how we can deal with that dynamic rather than to say, oh, public ownership will just solve the issue. This doesn't mean that for things like utilities in times of overlapping emergencies, climate crisis, uh, huge uh, fossil fuel, shocks already at the horizon, um, it might not be a good idea to um, uh, uh, bring the, the, the public um, ownership option on the table. And I think if we want to think about this, France might be actually an interesting case because they have been, I think, much more proactive on gas prices than most other European countries. Great. And w one thing I might add to that is that one of the com outcomes of this debate, um, if you agree with uh, the kind of the argument we're setting out, is that macro stabilization isn't just a monetary policy matter, it also um, you know, is down to uh, fiscal policy and to government to address. Absolutely, and I would argue that actually in this inflation, this has already been the lift policy reality. So even though central banks would probably disagree with this, but if we look at governments um, that had enough government capacity, so if we look at rich countries, <laughs> Um, basically, um, in Europe and the United States, then we see a lot of government activity trying to fight inflation in all sorts of ways, whether it's the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, whether it's the Supply Chain Task Force of President Biden, whether it's the various um, non-conventional fiscal policies that have happened, whether it's um, direct price stabilization, whether it's the European gas price cap, um, all of these are policies that at the end of the day, we're trying to somehow tackle inflation and we're clearly not implemented by central banks. Thank you. And um, yeah, if you want to speak to this question. Sure. I think Isabella has answered quite a, a, a few of the issues that were uh, raised. Let me just go back to, to Rory's question. I don't know exactly details about the ONS measure that they put out, but ultimately the difficulty is to can conduct measures that allow you to compare stocks and flows. So the flow of profits and then the stocks of capital and future valuations of profits and things like that. And of course, then making tiny changes can make huge differences to these measures. 
I think that the best thing we can do is to look at all the possible different measures that we have. Okay, and of course it's hard to kind of sell this then to 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 the press because the press has to mm -hmm. kind of have a condensed message. But 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 ultimately I think I think we can communicate all these different measures, and, and I think that's that's the the, the the most fruitful way of, of going about it. I I don't think that you know. Leaving aside the last uh, few years, the issue with inflation, but over the long run, I think there's no doubt that market power has gone up, that uh, whatever measure you use, that, that this has been the case. But in the short run, this may, may make huge differences. I think it's Melanie or this question about public ownership and utilities. I mean, ultimately, I, I think that it's not so much a question of ownership, it's about institutions, especially with, with competition policy. Let me give you an example of the difference between, you know, uh, freight transportation <laughs> over rail and freight transportation over uh, over uh, roads. You know, roads is supposed to be extremely competitive freight there, and on rail it's completely monopolized, depending on the country and the different uh, uh, issues. Now, if you think about it, you could say, well, the railway lines are typically publicly owned, but so are the roads. Okay. Now, there's a difference here because on the roads we have a separation of the network from the operators. And this is one of the things that we learned from competition policy in order that, you know, even though we have natural monopolies, which, are, which a road network is and which a rail network is, we have a natural monopoly, but we can create competition on natural monopolies by separating the network from the operation. Okay, that's called interoperability. And if you look at the, the Digital Markets Act that's being uh, uh, voted in the European Parliament, the, the, the uh, acts that we're gonna have here in the UK, interoperability is key to that. Okay, that's also one of the reasons why typically mobile phone plans in Europe are a lot cheaper than they are in the US. It's not because Europe is more pro-competitive than the US, but just on that one issue, there's interoperability in Europe and there is none in the United States. Interoperability, we have it kind of everywhere because my phone number allows me to call from uh, a, a, an operator in Spain to the United States, the UK, that's interoperable. I'm able to send emails from different service providers from, you know, my university to uh, the institute here to anywhere I can I can send emails across different operators, but I cannot send a message from WhatsApp to Telegram. You know, by the way, these guys use an interoperable device, which is the phone number, to identify you because they need you to be identified in an interoperable way. But they close the ecosystem if you want, and that's a way for them to create market power. So to, to kind of come to the conclusion of that discussion, I don't think it's so much an issue about public or private, which may make differences, it's about regulating the institutions that create competition on what we have in this digital economy, very networked uh, uh, kind of goods and very uh, uh, typically national monopolies that, 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 that create this market power. And then lastly, on, on Karsten's uh, view, sorry, questions, on, on, on the uh, institutions. I think it's important that these institutions, if, if we think about it broadly, there's fiscal policy, which I will leave on the side, but we have, let's say, the sentiment <coughs> to think about inflation and let's say instantaneous responses to price stability in this case. And we have competition policy, which I think of this as being a much more long-run way of dealing with this. These are, of course, closely connected because what happens in the short run is also has, has implications in the long run and vice, uh, vice versa. I said this earlier in the discussion that we had, at the moment we really heavily focus on this central bank kind of tool, if you want. And I think there's a, a lot of consensus, while it has many shortcomings, it's actually quite effective in controlling inflation. You know, I'd say, how can we have 9% inflation a year and a half ago? That wasn't very effective. Well, you know, the situation was quite uh, uh, unusual and, and, and in a sense maybe the tools that they've been using were not the right ones but they have at least you know the, the, the central bank has been able to, to respond to that. Instead if we see what happens at the level of competition policy there is much less kind of, of, of a, a powerful arm that can act there. Okay? We see that the competition policy for all the good intentions is having much less of an impact and this is you know, seen in terms of the rise that, 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 that in terms of profits, in terms of profitability, in terms of markets that we've seen in the last uh, four decades. And I think that it's important to, to give you know, sufficient weight to these two uh, arms, these two uh, uh, components. And they obviously have to take into account what you're saying, these, if you want, kind of more aggregate uh, 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 measures, which could be profitability 
Fantastic, thank you. Um, so, do you want to tackle the stimulus question? Yeah. Um, okay, so I mean, I, uh, we can't see the aggregate demand curve, we can't see the aggregate supply curve. Um, you know, I, confession, I was on team transitory, you know, I thought, I didn't think that the inflationary episode in the US would last as long as it did. Um, I think my, the point, I guess, the, I, I guess when I brought up aggregate demand first, it, I guess it was, that was sort of more in a, polit in a context of a kind of debate about this question rather than saying that it was all aggregate demand. Obviously there was a big aggregate supply shock associated with COVID, right? Everything was kind of, <coughs> it, there were lots of constraints, things were opening up at different times. Um, uh, so yeah, but let's, we can talk many hours about it. Let's do those two things outside. <laughs> Um, in which case, I'm going to Michelle on this forward looking competition policy question. Is, is that the <coughs> route we should take? Um, yeah, I, I, will, I will get to that because um, I think it's a really important point. But just to kind of again step back a little bit, it strikes me that there is a there's a kind of Venn diagram of inflation policy and tools and competition policy and tools, and these are clearly not and completely overlapping. Um, so on the one hand, competition policy deals with many ways in which market power um, manifests beyond being able to um, take advantage of a cost shock, for example. And on the other side, in, when we're kind of trying to target inflation, we're not just trying to target the sorts of firms or sectors or practices that would be of interest to competition policy. So for example, the um, what Samir mentioned around localized temporary monopoly i wouldn't be concerned about that from a competition policy perspective but it's small firms being able to leverage a, a short-term supply shock um that's you know firms without um broader market power without broader economic power and without broader uh, political power whereas on the other side i might be concerned about a big firm that is able to um under the under the uh cover of a cost shock and engage in tacit collusion with other big firms, even if they didn't cause it. So like the, the kind of motivation in a way is irrelevant because I'm concerned about then what does that do to consolidating their power going forward and their bargaining power in relation to the other um, factors of the economy. So that's just kind of one, um, one point. So on the, on the DMA um, and other such ex ante regulations. I think what's interesting is, again, competition policy kind of see, views things differently um, and views the types of evidence that is relevant differently. So I can I kind of understand and I find fascinating the discussion between Isabella and Jan and others around, you know, how might we build these kind of grand models to understand inflation. We don't need to do that within competition policy because um, we are looking quite narrowly at particular firms and particular sectors things like earnings call um, information absolutely can come into a competition um, um, analysis. Mm -hmm. They look at board documents, they look at um, you know, what they say, then they have the competition authority have the power to um, <coughs> ask for data and ask for information that's not publicly available. They're not reliant only on what data is out there. And so it, it kind of speaks to a potentially different regulatory model um, around Carson's question of kind of what would we then be, you know, if we think about, um, as I and others have, have alluded to, a potential for a regulatory regime where we look at systemically important companies across different systemically important sectors, um, from a competition point perspective, com competition policy perspective, once you identify those, you then kind of dive deep into those sectors, you can look at very different, ask for different sorts of data, you can also, um, as we've seen in the enforcement of the DMA, engage civil society and external independent researchers to effectively monitor those markets on behalf of the competition authority and bring cases. Um, you know, competition policy has all sorts of different tools, including private enforcement um, and class action cases. You know, there's all sorts of different ways in which um, we might investigate what would be the link around other manifestations of power um, that we haven't kind of traditionally looked at. And one just point to respond to one point that um, that Jan made is that competition policy has been a kind of weak arm in um, in, in containing corporate power, but that has been under a very specific paradigm of an understanding of competition policy, which has been just incredibly poorly enforced 
effectively since the 1970s, 80s. So I would say that that's not necessarily a good indicator of what we could do. Clearly there are limits um, and it's not capable of, of, of doing everything. But what I'm interested in is how can we hone in on those systemically important firms and systemically important prices and is competition policy a potential way to do that? I think there will be there's an interesting conversation there. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm keen to not stand too much in the way of everyone here and the drinks, um, but I'm going to take one more question. I don't know if some of you wasn't in uh, the discussion earlier. Um, Josh. Uh, yeah, I just want to talk about uh, uh, recent monetary policy, I guess. It seemed like Jan, you uh, seem to be implying that the central banks take some credit for the fall in inflation we've seen over the last few months, perhaps not. Um, but I guess the more general question to people is, you know, do you, you know, what's your view of what central banks have actually done with interest rates over the last kind of 18 months? Um, and uh, I suppose speaking to the other's point around climate change, you know, do we need a bit of a shift in uh, how we think about inflation? If we are, you know, are we now entering a new regime where supply side shocks will be the more important driver? of inflation or, or long-term inflation um, and if so do we need to think move beyond interest rates as the main tool for dealing with, with that kind of supply side inflation great thank you um, and i'll take one from the gentleman behind you okay thank you everyone for your interest in talks um, there's two quick points i'd like to make one is more quantitative and one is more general I'll keep it brief. So there is a recent paper by uh, Barrow in the National Bureau of Economic Research where they try to quantitatively sort of evaluate the different channels of inflation. And they use this uh, framework of Eric Lieber, it's the fiscal theory of price level. And they find about 40 to 50% could be attributed to this fiscal stimulus. So that leaves about 60 to 50% of these other channels, which includes the sellers inflation that you were talking about potentially. And the second point is that a week on Wednesday, there's going to be the autumn statement and Jeremy Hunt is not expected to give any changes in the income tax brackets, but since we were talking about inflation being a redistribution, in fact, if the tax <coughs> brackets remain at the level that they are, that's an effective increase in the tax burden because wage inflation is around six, seven, eight percent. So there's people at the bottom of the distribution being dragged into those higher tax brackets. So I was wondering if anybody could sort of talk a little bit about fiscal drag and that being a source of redistribution as well. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I think those questions uh, lead us quite nicely into what could be um, closing remarks. Um, perhaps related to Josh's point, um, I would be interested if you if you want to comment on it on how much you think the kind of recent experience in inflation and the role of profits challenges our current paradigms, whether it's in macro policy or whether it's in competition policy. Um, so uh, quite a few questions there. Again, you don't have to address all of them. Um, just may I wonder. And particularly given that kind of autumn statement question, very UK focused, if that might be one of you. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So, so the question was about higher tax brackets and whether fiscal drag will mm. be a source of redistribution. Like, yes, hundred um, mm. percent, yes. Um, <coughs> it's a huge. Um, you know, I think they they froze the tax specials for ages. It's kind of was quite a small, relatively small tax change when they first announced it. it with every you know year inflation was higher than they think it's a, it's a bigger one. Um, so that's clearly um, redistributive. I was listening to, I was actually, I spent a non-trivial part of today trying to Google where I heard this. I couldn't find an original <laughs> source. Um, and I'm gonna break my normal rule and sort of tell it, tell it to you anyway. But I think it was Paul Johnson of the IFS. Um, basically talking about the UK tax system versus other countries and saying that actually we don't, relative to other co countries, um, it's not that we tax the business sector less, um, and actually we tax the, those on higher incomes, you know, we don't tax them a, a, a reasonable amount, quite a lot as well. Um, actually where the UK differs relative to say the Scandies is that we, it's the middle of the income distribution that actually is, is really not taxed as much as in those other countries. And sure, we get your benefits than they do, um, but that that is kind of where the the sort of gap lies, which I hadn't I hadn't really known before I heard that. And it would be really helpful if I could if I could find where he said it. Um, um, but I think that might be kind of an interesting context for thinking about the effects of all of these um, tax changes coming up. 
Thank you. Um, yeah. Josh, you, you, you asked me directly. I don't think it's the view necessarily, I mean, I don't know, but I don't think it necessarily to the central bank policy. In fact, if you have a supply chain distortion, you basically have shortages, you raise rates, you make it harder to make up for those shortages in the investment. So, so I mean, I, I think in the central banks, people have recognized this and are thinking about ways in which they should kind of broaden the toolkit depending on what kind of source of inflation you, you, uh, uh, you have. And I don't think people have a good answer to that in, in central banks and everybody else to either. So, um, so I would say in short, I don't think it's because of the central bank uh, uh, policy that, that uh, inflation has gone down. I think it's just, you know, supply has adjusted over time. And, and that's one of, one of the, the things. Um, there was the, the, um, uh, the question about the, the fiscal theory of the price level. I mean, this theory has been around for a long time. I mean, it's, 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 I think it makes sense. I mean, the, the numbers you quote, I didn't know that paper. Uh, um, the Kowalski paper, though, actually. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, I haven't seen it, but, but, but I mean, that makes sense. I mean, the fiscal theory of the price level is against stocks and flows. You know, what happens to the future is going to be reflecting what people do uh, uh, today. Still, there's a lot of other things that we need to explain beyond the, 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 the fiscal part. And I, but I think, you know, this was out of vogue completely until, you know, uh, two years ago when people started saying, this, this that makes a, 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 a lot of sense. And I think with, with what we see is, is in general, in terms of economic policy, what I've learned from the last three years is that we have to be much more broad kind of thinking in terms of tools and that everything is interconnected. Fiscal policy, uh, competition policy and monetary policy are kind of very tightly uh, connected. And the only way we're going to be able to, to properly do policy is to be really interconnected. Fantastic, thank you. And is that a... Yeah, thanks for a great set of questions. So, uh, whether monetary policy works, I think it might be helpful to take a step back and uh, look at the last two decades or so. I mean, we have been trying to use monetary policy to actually encourage inflation <laughs> and growth. Um, and I think it's pretty um, general sense that this didn't really work. Um, so there was an over-reliance on monetary policy before the return of inflation. Um, and I would say that if we want to assess whether monetary policy works in bringing down inflation, um, uh, I haven't seen any convincing rigorous evidence of that. I think it's also too, this definitely too early to say, because even the proponents of that statement would say that there are time lags of I don't know, four to seven months or something, right? So we are very far away from saying, uh, from having any empirical um, evidence that would back up the statement monetary policy has worked in bringing down inflation. If we um, take those who have been arguing for monetary policy as the tool to fight inflation um, uh, by their own um, uh, criteria, then people like Larry Summers have been saying we need to get unemployment of five to six percent, right? We are very far away in the United States from unemployment um, from five to six percent. The ECB has been saying that instead of seeing actually um, increases in, in unemployment of the type that they have expected, they have seen labor hoarding on the part of firms. That's the terminology that they use, right? So it's not the case that we see the intended cool down of the labor market that would have been one of the most important generous that the proponents of fighting inflation in that way would have pointed to to necessarily operate. Um, so I would say that as far as, as the evidence that we have in hand goes, it's really not looking like monetary policy uh, was the main um, uh, uh, game in town here. But I think it's pretty clear and on that we actually have increasing um, evidence that um, uh, 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 that um, uh, monetary policy has all sorts of rather um, undesirable effects, right? Um, so, uh, um, I mean, uh, decrease in investments in renewables, for example, um, uh, because you have these very high capex costs, so um, interest rates matter much more for renewables than for many other sectors. So, um, there has been reporting in the Financial Times, which is suggested that some of the IRA has actually been offset by the effect of high interest rates um, uh, 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 in terms of renewable investments. We also see a housing market um, that uh, is clearly destabilized. I mean, in the German case, um, sorry to 
always give these general examples, but because I worked there last year trying to find inflation, I'm following it rather closely. Um, so in the German case, housing prices have already gone down by 10%. Um, that is quite substantial. Um, and if you look at how leveraged a lot of the borrowing is in the context of um, very low interest rates, and uh, uh, this, is, this is rather dramatic, right? And that can be pretty directly linked to, um, to um, monetary policy. We also see that monetary policy, of course, affects um, smaller um, smaller medium um, firms much more than large firms. Um, so um, if if this inflation has had something to do with corporate structures, then relying on monetary policy, I think, if anything, is to the disadvantage of smaller firms, because larger firms can um, finance themselves um, on capital markets. We have also seen that um, banks have been making windfall profits um, on the back of monetary policy as a new round of um, windfall profits. We have also increasingly reports that banks um, are actually um, uh, uh, searching for the most creditworthy um, uh, lenders in this like increasingly unstable environment, which again tend to be um, large firms. So I think we have a lot of evidence <laughs> of all the problems that come with monetary policy. And I think that we, in some sense, still got lucky because the interest rates were so low. And I'm actually personally not a fan of near zero interest rates because I think this brings up a set of other problems. So, but now imagine you have another mega shock and you have already hiked interest rates. You already have the list of issues that I have been pointing to. You already have a collapse in real wages. You already are at the brink of a recession or you might already be in a recession. Um, and then you have another mega shock, and then you say, oh, sorry, the only thing I can do is hike interest rates. I think this would be um, really um, not be prepared for shocks that we can already see coming, which is why I'm advocating for a shift to a form of economic disaster preparedness that needs to involve a toolbox. And I think we have to go away from constantly saying, oh, if you are for this, like, I don't know, you think direct price civilization is helpful, but I think um, it can only be antitrust and therefore we not, don't talk anymore to each other. I think we have to move to like a kind of an all cards on deck approach to really try to think about um, ways in which we can be prepared and focus on the systemically important sectors that can have the, these, this huge systemic um, implications for the economy as a whole. Thank you. Um, Michelle. Uh, yeah, thank you all for those fantastic um, comments. So, so much kind of thought provoking um, work being done. I guess what, where I'm left with on kind of Harris's question on um, the role of this debate and competition policy in particular is that I see, um, I see inflation really as a spearhead issue into competition policy. Um, so those of us who've been working for the last decade to try to strengthen competition policy have faced this fundamental issue, which is that people don't see corporate power or regulators don't see corporate power. Actually, everyday people do see corporate power. Um, and so what's, so what's useful is the fact that your work is highlighting well, here's potential corporate power. Okay, it's, it's an incomplete picture and um, it may not be the complete story, but um, Jan's, Jan's work has done the same. It's at least giving further evidence to the fact that corporate power is a problem and it, is some, it exists. <coughs> it's something that competition policy should direct itself towards. And I completely agree that this kind of, um, yeah, let's get it all, let's get, use all the different policy levers that we can to deal with these kind of shocks in different ways. And competition policy can contribute in some limited ways and it has its own way of working. And one of those ways is that it can target firms and sectors. So let's use that. Like, let's see what, what relevance that has for some of the um, problems and crises that, that Isabella and others are, are talking about. Because again, it's, it's, well, if I go to a competition policy conference and people will say, well, that's nothing to do with us. Like, that's monetary policy. That's, you know, that's macro. Like, we, we only care about these kind of very narrow things. And ultimately, that's just not true because the policy as enacted has implications. And, you know, one of the interesting things from your just most, the, your last remarks is, um, you know, the ways in which monetary policy may facilitate consolidation and it can do so in, in lots of different ways, especially when exacerbated by crisis, that's got to be relevant to how we, you know, how activists we are in, in antitrust policy at a particular moment in time, as opposed to just 
assuming that we should have like one model that fits all mm -hmm. time and all, all scenarios, actually we need to be taking that sort of thing into account. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, that's a huge amount of food for thought. Um, we do now have some drinks and also some snacks. I know you said you didn't want to relax in the face of overlapping crises. It's a small relaxation before we get back into that. Um, so I just want to say a huge uh, thank you um, again to OSF for supporting um, our work on this and this event, uh, to each of our speakers, to Michelle, to Isabella, to Yann and Sumea. Um, to our audience for fantastic questions um, and, and your attention, to the RPPR and Commonwealth teams for putting on uh, this event, particularly Holly and Olivia. Um, and I just want to thank Carson and Chris who've been leading our work on this at our institutions and to say if you have questions about this whole agenda <laughs> or what we can publish, then find them, uh, find them next. Um, but huge thanks and do join us uh, for a drink. <laughs>